All righty, we'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Be reminded as you turn there and as you hear these words that these are God the Holy Spirit's words that He breathed through the Apostle Paul. They are divinely inspired. And so these words of God have full divine authority. They are without error of any kind. And they are fully sufficient for all that we're supposed to believe and do. 1 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even tolerated among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Let's pray. Our Lord God, we thank You for Your all-encompassing authority over the entire universe. And we especially thank You for Your authority over the church. And as Christ is head of the church, so You have delegated authority, though You are still present to the church to do things like discipline. Let us be sober. Help us to desire to know what this power is that you speak of. And make us humble that we would not be the sorts that would think that we can't fall, that we don't have terrible (coughs) amounts of sin in us that would leap out of its cage and contaminate the body and disgrace your name and and make shipwreck of our own souls and, and of others. So give to us or teach us what you've already given to us, this power to discipline. May we not take it lightly. May we not be arrogant in either way, either in presuming that we can handle this ourselves or in presuming that we are the ones that create the judgment. The judgment belongs to you. And now teach us our responsibility. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, As you may have noticed, that was an awkward break in the text. Um, You could could, read the whole chapter. You could stop it anywhere, and you're going to run into that because really the whole chapter goes together. I I do think it's worth spending two weeks on um, for a lot of reasons. One, it's 13 verses. Um, The other is just thematically... Everything we talk about today is going to be in the passage next week, too. And everything we introduce from the passage next week is going to be here in this first passage, roughly. So there's overlap. But the main theme here, you can see in the title. The title I've chosen to call Excommunication, colon, When We Have Been Too Arrogant for Normal Discipline. Excommunication is for a lot of things. It's terrible. It's a last step, it's a last resort. It's church discipline in the last resort at the last stage. But excommunication is when we have been too arrogant for the normal parts of discipline. Now, what images tend to come into your mind when you think about church discipline? What thoughts do you have? Um, What pictures do you have? Do you have bad memories? Bad taste in your mouth? Um, Do you have a picture of like a a guillotine coming down, and a mob at the French Revolution, or, or, or maybe a scarlet letter in a, in a Puritan church with people just confessing their sins out loud, indiscriminately. Terrifying. Um, some smoke-filled room, uh, leadership, some cultic thing. 
Um, or a church that's more seeker-driven didn't do it at all, and therefore you saw how people get hurt that way. What, what do you conjure up in your mind when you hear church discipline? Because I want to suggest that it is a very good, kind, gracious gift of God, partly so that we can avoid the last stage of church discipline. Discipline's a lot of things, but one of the things it definitely is that's often overlooked is the sense in which church discipline is a gracious covering to contain sin. Church discipline is a lot of things, but it is at least a covering to contain sin. It's a lot like the law in this sense. It's not given to eradicate sin. It doesn't have the power to create life or to motivate us otherwise in the depths of our heart. It doesn't have that kind of power. But it is effective. It is a power to meet sin as a force, a wall, a check, a balance. And in this passage today, it's the last stage of church discipline, that extreme final measure, as we call it, excommunication. And that's just a Latin word, ex meaning out of, and then communion. Someone that's out of communion, out of fellowship. That's what the word means, literally. But excommunication is in view here, the extreme, the last resort. And so when we think of covering sin, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. You might be thinking, when you think of covering sin, you might be thinking of, especially if you're watching the news lately with the Roman Catholic Church, you might be thinking of a cover-up or politics, cover-ups everywhere. Um, In other words, hypocrisy. And indeed, that kind of covering is exactly what the Corinthians are guilty of here. They are engaged in a cover-up. They are being arrogant. But there is a good kind of covering, like a lid, a lid on sin. Not to hide it, not to pretend it's not there, but precisely to nip it in the bud, to keep it from doing what it does. Now, because of the nature of this letter, Paul's answering questions. It's Ask Pastor Paul, and he's, he's going through, and from here on out, the chapter breaks often are going to begin with, now concerning this question. Now concerning your next question, now concerning, there's that phrase that keeps breaking it up. Up until now, Paul's been setting the big picture, the big problem in Corinth. Now he's going to start tackling the symptoms. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go in a slightly different order than the text itself. And instead of going through verse 1 through 6, we're going to see everything in 1 through 6. We'll read it. We'll cover it. But we're going to read it thematically. We're going to look at the three big things that show up in 1 through 6. First, we're going to look at the Lord's authority. Second, the people's arrogance. Third, the man's sin. And those are really always in play. The Lord's authority is going to rest in the assembly. The people's arrogance is that we can cover. We got this, God. That's what I'm going to mean by the people's arrogance. And then thirdly, the man's sin discredits and contaminates the body. So short version again, the Lord's authority, the people's arrogance, and the man's sin. And the big idea, if you get lost at any point, this is what we're supposed to get out of the passage today. Since discipline is a God-given covering for sin, let's not resort to an arrogant man-made covering. Really, this is a battle of two different coverings. That's what's going on here. Two different kinds of coverings. Because discipline is a God-given covering for sin, let's not be arrogant and resort to a man-made covering. Okay? So discipline is many things, but discipline is to cover sin. But you remember in the Garden of Eden, there were two coverings after sin. There was a man-made covering, the fig leaf, but then there was a second, a sacrifice. There was man's efforts and works to hide and deal with his sin. And then there was God's gracious provision, an animal to cover them, which symbolized the sacrifice of Christ. And so this is a battle of two different coverings. Let's first of all look at the Lord's authority. The Lord's authority rests on the assembly and in the assembly. And this is potentially going to be the most complex part of the passage, and so that's why we're doing it first. There seems to be three authorities that Paul really talks about in this passage. If you look close enough, especially in verses 3 and 4, you're going to see three sources of authority to discipline in this passage. Christ, Paul, and the church. So let's carefully pour over these words to get a sense of it. First of all, Paul's going to, in a sense, assert himself as an apostle. He says in verse 3, 
For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. So uh, this is going to be the source that is least uh, uh, normative for us today. In a sense, it's going to be the one that we think that doesn't apply to us. Hopefully we've got our theology good enough where we say, well, we're not apostles. Hopefully we know that. We got that down. We don't have that card in our wallet. Apostle, Apostle Matt. It's not me. Um, In fact, we don't even go to churches that are headed by apostles. Okay, so we don't have that issue. And so what's this got to do with us? Well, notice I said that it is the least normative authority today, not that it's not normative at all. The creed calls the church apostolic for a reason. There is something apostolic about the true church, all churches that name Christ's name and believe in him. Now, Roman Catholics and Charismatics just get this wrong on two different extremes. Um, For Rome, apostolic succession means that there was a physical passing on of one authority to another. And smoke comes out of the chimney and boom, you got yourself a new pope. And you can trace that all the way back to Peter. Because that's apostolic to the Catholic Church means physical place, physical line. That's what they mean by that. Okay? Charismatics, not all, but some in the what's sometimes called apostolic, they'll use that objective sometimes, um, to refer to, and now they'll use super apostles. Ironically, they don't realize that uh, Paul wasn't meaning that in a nice way. Um, super apostles to mean people that come in the latter days where Pentecost is restored and so forth. And so you have living apostles now. Now, you could add Mormons to that. I just wanted to talk about um, groups that were you know, Christian in, in, in that sense. Um, and so just because people use the word apostolic wrong doesn't mean that there's not something to be gained from this authority that Paul is asserting. So what is it? Well, true ap- apostolicity, it's a word. Uh, your spell checker may not think so, but, but it's a word. And uh, it's not about physical secession from the Roman church, but it is about passing down something. There's something being passed down to us here. And that something is the gospel teaching of the apostles. How do you know when it's a true church? When they teach what the apostles taught in the New Testament. And so what's he talking about? What does this do for us? Well, the, the right way to know that you, are, that you have this authority that Paul asserted is right there in verse 3 and verse 4. It's this context to heed the words right here. This is not just words to a Corinthian church. It's preserved in the Bible for us to take this same thing this seriously. These are the apostolic blueprints for church discipline. By submitting to Scripture here, not just in other places, we come under the authority of Christ in this very act of discipline. We don't want to be under the authority of Christ in everything else except for church discipline and say that we're under the authority of Christ. We're not. This power is something for us today. Now, you might not, I don't see any power there. Now, political power, I understand that. Military power, I understand that. Well, I understand that because that's, that's that, the aspect of an unbeliever that you still have in your heart. This is the real power, an eternal power. It's not something mystical either. It's about our submission to the clear words of the Bible. And if we obey the Bible in passages like this, we can be assured of the Bible's promise that God is acting with this power. Now, in the context of Matthew 18, it's another passage that people read uh, in union with this passage, and rightly so. That's where Jesus says in Matthew 18, 20, at the very end of the discipline passage, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. I don't know how many people I've heard use this passage as like a, a, a mechanism for not going to church. Think about it. Well, it's, here we are, there's two of us. Bam! Let's not go to church. Uh, no, not only no, but that's very ironic because you need to be under church discipline right now. And the context of Jesus's words is that I will bless this act of discipline. It's not there to baptize like worshiping in nature or at home because you've found another guy to agree to, to rebel with. Okay, that, that's not the idea. In fact, that's the exact opposite of the idea. You're actually in rebellion and twisting the words that ironically are about you needing to be under discipline right now. That's, but that's normal. Now, he brings in 
the other two more normative authorities in one breath. So that's apostolic authority. How do we have that? By obeying the words that the apostles wrote in the New Testament. But these are the two more normal ones that we're always having to deal with. Verse 4, when you, you the church, are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus. Now, first things first, before we talk about how Christ and the church, how they both rule in this sense, let's deal with that word power. Uh, it's a very loaded term in the Greek. Usually when it comes up, it's the word that means the same thing as authority. Here it's not. Here Paul deliberately uses one of the more, what you're thinking, explosion or moving things in the world, like uh, the sword, like military power. And that's exactly what he's claiming right here. Power, dunamite, it's actually where we get the English word dynamite from. It's used oftentimes about what the Holy Spirit does. So why is he using that word here instead of the word for authority? Well, my view is he has in mind the end of the last chapter. Remember we have that showdown with the Corinthians and says, the kingdom of God isn't about talk, it's about power. And you're reading that like, like Paul saying, we'll see, we'll see who, who backs down when I get there, when I, when I come. You guys are acting like I'm not going to come. And, and you're thinking, what is he talking about? Is, is Paul like calling them out like he's going to punch them out or something like that? And we, we said that's not what he's talking about, but we have to wait to see what he is talking about. Well, here we are in chapter 5. Paul is under the impression that when you do this thing called church discipline, even if it has to wait till judgment day for you to see it, you're going to find out that God was moving through the sword of his king, Jesus Christ, to separate things in the kingdom. You'll see that a little bit more clearly in chapter 11, verse 19 as well. There must be factions or divisions among you so that it may be plain who is genuine among you. Now, in this lifetime, you may never find out, oh, that's what happened. And sometimes there are those moments, like a generation later, there was one guy at the Northampton Church in the 1760s and 70s that realized about firing Jonathan Edwards in 1750. Oh, and regretted it and took it to his grave. For most people, that, that waits till judgment day. Um, but what Paul is saying here is that that's real power. Even if you never see it in this lifetime, Christ's sword is always moving, dealing with rebels in his house. He's a king. He's a perfect king. He doesn't, he doesn't approve of rebellions in his house. And so Paul is talking about that kind of power. It, there, the phrase is used, and you've heard this, the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom. And uh, here's where it comes from. Matthew 16, 19. You also hear about it in Matthew 18. But Jesus is talking to Peter. He makes his great confession, and he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now that's the ESV and the NASB. I actually prefer that in this case because there's a very rare Greek construction there and the NASB picks up on this. The NASB has whatever will have been bound. I'm sorry, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Now, why the NASB picks up on that and all the commentators see this and, and the ESV doesn't, it's another story. Now, this is still true because God is acting through human agents. So it's still true that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and so forth. But what we need to understand is that it's not us that actually jiggles the keys at God and says, we got a stray down here. And then kick him off and say, did I get that right? Um, it's supposed to go the other way. Human beings are going to mess this up, okay? But so if you get the idea that human beings are the originators of these decisions, that's what Rome did. This is not justifying that understanding of you having power. Just the opposite. We should be solemn about this. We should be grave about this. We should, we should be fearful about this and making sure we get this right so that these decisions are a true reflection of what God is doing in heaven. Now, we might not think about church discipline like that, but the Bible does. And Christ actually delegates this as a stewardship to human beings, which is horrifying. But he has. And so we have to take it more seriously. 
Now back to those two authorities that are always in play, Christ and the church. Look at the text again. It draws attention to when you are assembled. When you are assembled. Now, it doesn't use the word for, for ch- the usual word for church, ecclesia, which also means assembled. But it uses the word that we get the word synagogue from. When you are gathered together. When you're in synagogue mode. And now, why does he do that? Is it because the focus is on the elders? I don't know. But he uses this word, but there's no doubt that he's saying, when you're in church, and there's another problem, church is, you know, nature's my church, and home's my church, and, or sometimes we're not that out there, and we'll say, well, church isn't a building. Okay, church isn't a building, but it is an assembly. And so you gathering does matter, and we're assembled as in a court here. That's not why I came to church. You, you better change that and fix that before you die. Because God's church is not your plaything. Oh, I don't go to church to hear about courts. I know it's because you're a rebel. That, that's what rebels think about courtrooms. They're not fond of courtrooms. The way to fix this is to not pit God's court in the assembly versus whatever all these other, and there are many blessings that we get in God's assembly. But he said, when, he, when you're assembled, one of the things I want you to do is deal with these cases because you are a court, whether you like it or not. You're many other things, but you are at least a court. Now he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then he says later in the same verse, with the power of the Lord Jesus. Now the name of, of Jesus there isn't some magic mantra. It's in his authority. So there's where authority comes in. It's, it's with his sanction, acting as his ambassador. Yeah, but people do that wrong. Do it right. Don't flee from your responsibilities. In the name of the Lord Jesus. So, so in other words, Christ is still the present presiding judge through your decision. His hands on his gavel are right here on your hand. You say, oh, I'm opting out of that. You've got to pull away from his hand actively to do that because his word is clear that you are to do this under the authority of Christ, in the name of Christ, with the power of Christ. Your hands and your energy and your human powers are right now inside of his powers. And you have to go out of your way to abdicate your responsibility to not perform church discipline. Now, There's how we exercise this power. Verse 5, what does this mean? Well, in this case, because they wouldn't do that, and we'll get to that, he says, you are to deliver this man to Satan. Now stop, Paul is having this conversation with them and not the Galatians, not the Ephesians, not the Romans, not the, he could have, maybe, maybe they had problems like this too, but as far as we know, they didn't get that bad. He's having this conversation with Corinth because they wouldn't do it, and it's come to this. So now he has to say, You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Let's stop right there. I don't have this in my notes, but also against Rome in the Middle Ages. This doesn't justify inquisitions. Destruction of his flesh doesn't mean you, while you're at it, destroy his flesh. No, (laughs) no. He's saying you are to cut this man out. Now, outside of the blessings and protection of the church, bad things will happen to him. That's what destruction of his flesh means. But if it's that bad thing is a wake-up call. He's not saying you have to be the agent, the, 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 the angel of death that administers God's pain to him. That's not the point. This isn't about inquisitions or anything. But he says, deliver this man over to Satan. And, that, and then the next phrase is within that. And so bad things are going to happen to him being delivered over to Satan. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. In, in a sense, God's saying, you wouldn't discipline him? Hand him over to Satan. I'll discipline him. Luther said that Satan is God's Satan. He's on a short leash. He can't do anything that God has not decreed. And so all the bad stuff he's going to do to this person may work out that person's perdition, but it may actually be a wake-up call too. And God is saying, part of what he's saying is, you you won't do it? Fine, I'll do it, and I'm God, I do it perfectly, and I'll sick Satan on him for his destruction, or maybe his whole, if his whole life has to come, by the way, you should pray like this, God, if you have to um, mess up everything in their life, in my brother or sister or friend or coworker that I love, do whatever you have to do to bring them to salvation. Don't we pray like that? 
That's really, the heart here is for restoration. Notice that Paul is blaming them for not um, excommunicating him. So he's not just blaming them for not doing all the stuff that led to it. He's having to actually say, by the way, now that it's gotten to this point, you have to do that. And that shows that excommunication was in their legitimate power. He wouldn't be saying, do this already, if they were not obliged to do it already. They had the keys. They stared at the keys. They fiddled with the keys. They lost the keys. They had the keys to the kingdom. They said, what are these for? It's not power. What are these for? Uh, I've seen so many people abuse them. Oh, what do you have the keys? Oh, and then somebody shrinks back in humility and said, no, I don't have the keys. I'm not certain about anything. And they put the keys away. Well, what Paul is saying is, you're sitting on the keys. Use the keys. And notice the ending, so that they'll be saved. In another passage, which is put with the keys, and even though it doesn't mention the word, people use it in this context, Jesus says, we looked at this in the class, John 20, 23. Um, this is the other part of that passage. Jesus, after he says, as the Father who sent me, so I send you, receive the Holy Spirit. And he gives a, a power to the church. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, you know very well that you and I don't get to forgive people of their sins in the ultimate sense. And so again, Christ is using us as agents to display what's already true in heaven or if they're reprobate, what's not true in heaven. We become agents of that, acting that out, proving that out, being, by our judicial decisions, um, signposts throughout their life of their election or their reprobation. It's serious business. But it's ultimately, our heart is to restore them. That's why destruction of the flesh doesn't mean all that bad stuff that we're maybe thinking about. Well, secondly, that was the biggest section because it's the hardest thing, the whole authority. So who does this, Christ or Paul or me? Or is this just a one-time thing in Corinth, this crazy guy doing this crazy sin, and so it's that bad? Um, no, it's normative. That's why it's in the Bible. Secondly, though, the people's arrogance. Here's what happens when we say, we got this covered. We got this, God. We got it covered. Should we discipline this person? Should this, is this a church discipline? Oh, no, 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 let's... No. Arrogance, though. The arrogance of the church as a whole. Look at the words, verse 2. And you are arrogant. Who's he speaking to? Speaking to the church. You are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Now, this could also mean, or at least part of it could be, the arrogance that you've already heard about in the first four chapters. How are you arrogant right now? Why are you talking about your glitz and glamour and results and church growth and, and you could this dude is doing this? And, and I think that might be part of it for sure. But arrogance. Two things they should be doing, Paul says. And he notices they're not doing it. They should have the right heart and they should have the right action. And that's clear to Paul. And they should be clear to us as well. Mourning and removal. Ought you not rather to mourn? That should be their heart, and it's obvious it's not. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Removal from the body, and it's obvious that that's not happening either. So it's clear that the heart is for restoration, but these people are not doing either. They, when they hear church discipline, that's, that's not on their radar screen. But the weird thing about it is that Paul doesn't say, don't you know the Scriptures? He assumes they do. He says they're arrogant. That's odd. I mean, shouldn't he say, this guy's doing this? That's the stuff you only see on the Jerry Springer show. And that's literally the way you should read this because that's the whole point to this man's sin. And then he doesn't say, that guy's arrogant. He says, you're arrogant. How, what? How does that work? Well, this is very ironic these self-professed spiritual giants who we just read about in chapters 1 through 4, these superstars that would drag Paul into their court because of Paul's unwinsome speech, 
these who would point to Paul's weaknesses and bad luck in life and suffering as evidence in their court that Paul was fake and they were real, Paul's secret sin that disqualified Paul, these guys are presiding over not just a court where this is going on. There's no court at all. There's no court happening. There's a cover-up. Paul is saying, is this what you were calling moral seriousness just a second ago when I was disqualified and you guys were superstars? Letting this guy who should be like a superstar on the Jerry Springer show be like running around in your church? Is that what you meant by moral seriousness? I didn't catch that the first time because I was too busy being accused of all these things like suffering and so on. But is this, is this what you meant by mature? This guy running around? You're arrogant. There's a cover-up. Again, when you think of a cover-up, you might think of the current scandal. Rome or Washington, D.C. Pick a scandal. That's what we're thinking of. But don't let your minds wander to such an extreme and imagine that we're somehow immune to this, that we can't engage in such a cover-up. The sin that Paul calls arrogant here is happening any time we trade any amount of legitimate church discipline for we got this, God. We, don't we do that in life all the time? Oh, we got this. We know something's wrong. We know there's a fire. But instead of getting somebody, can you help me put out this fire? Because it's too embarrassing. We say, I, I'll, I'll just take care of it before anybody finds out. And we go back to the fire and indulge in it. And it gets out of control. So he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now, here's how I know that this is the arrogance he's talking about. The ultimate arrogance in, in, in all of their arrogance is, we got this covered, God. Don't you know, Paul's going to teach them the principle of why that doesn't work. Your cover doesn't work. Because this is like, and he uses imagery, leaven spreading through a whole batch of dough. And the batch of dough is the church and the leaven, and it's used in a bad context here. It's used in Galatians 5, 9 as well for false teaching. Here it's used of sin. That will contaminate, the, it'll spread. It'll grow throughout the whole body. And this piece of imagery from the Old Testament is coupled with others. God is often angry with the whole assembly because of the sin of one lone individual. Here's an example. Joshua 7.1. They go to war. Rinky-dink town. I mean, they just knocked over Boise. And then they show up in Emmett. It's going to burn down a couple of cherry trees. And they lose. What's up with that? Well, God had given them directions back in Jericho to not take any of the devoted things for your own use. You were going to burn it, burn it all, right? And there was this one guy, Achan, who said, ah, you know, I could just take one or two. He takes one or two. He knows it's wrong. Cover up. Joshua 7.1. But the people of Israel broke faith. They did? I thought it was one dude. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan was one guy. For Achan took some of the devoted things and the anger of the Lord burned against just Achan. No, it says it burned against the people of Israel. Now, in the end of the day, they did the right thing. They took Achan and they stoned him and they stoned all his stuff and took all the stones and piled more stones on top of him just in case anybody got the idea that we didn't stone this guy. We totally stoned this guy. There's nothing but stones there. So they did the right thing eventually, but notice that God was angry at the whole people because of the sins of one individual. Now, that might not seem to mesh with our American individualism today. And we might easily confuse this, and here's why I think this might not be meshing with us. We might easily confuse this with what we talked about this week, the kind of false corporate repentance that we see in the current demands for so-called racial justice. But just because there's a, a, a fraud out there, don't miss the genuine article. Don't miss the real thing in a sea of frauds. Here's the rationale. Here's how you can know when a group is guilty for the sins of the individual. 
It's not because you've confused the sins of the individual with the sins of the group. That would be fraud. But here's what's going on. If rebellion against Christ is going on in the camp, and I don't care, and we don't care, do you see the difference already? If there's rebellion against Christ in this room, and I'm not doing it, but I don't care, I'm doing something blameworthy. I may not be doing the same thing as Achan, but I am enabling it. If there's rebellion going on and I wink at it, then is there really only one lone rebel? If I'm in the getaway car, oh, I didn't rob the bank. <laughs> I mean, you'd see it clearly in that case. But this is what's going on when there's this kind of covenantal guilt. It's not because we confuse the individual with the collective. It's because the collective doesn't give a rip. All the other people didn't care, winked at it. And so this is a conspiracy of silence. And so one reason it's arrogant to forsake discipline is that the wrath of God abides over even his own assembly in a certain respect. His wrath has been taken away from individuals in Christ. We see that. But his wrath can stand over a church, a church strand. We have no categories for that. There's only individuals and then all those crazy collectivist people. It's not the way God thinks. There are groups of people, and we're responsible. By the way, if you don't think you're responsible for groups of people because you're that libertarian, don't be a father. Dramatic pause. Um, don't do that because we're responsible for each other. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, totally. That's why Cain got drove, driven away. And so we're arrogant to think that God's wrath does not abide on communities. Here's another reason it's arrogant to think in this way that what overcomes one of our brothers or sisters cannot possibly overcome us. Oh yeah, I see Achan, he did that. What a fruit loop. I would never do that. When we think that way, what does 1 Corinthians 10, 12 say? Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Remember pride comes before the fall? Uh, saying, oh, I can handle this fire. I'm not dope like him. I can put a lid on it. I can control this. And so this mourning that Paul talks about, you should mourn, is sympathy and it's also sobriety to know that that can happen to us. Here's a third reason that this shows arrogance in the body at large. It's at the very heart of the imagery that Paul uses. Leaven. Leaven grows. Leaven expands. Even if you don't think you'll make the same mistake that guy made, He's made the mistake, and it's growing. You've got a responsibility to put it out. You've got a responsibility for all the people that you're placed in charge over to make sure that they are not contaminated by that. Leaven here is a bad thing, right? You can see that in the imagery. And so the moral imperative here is clear. Contain that leaven. Reverse that outward march of sin. Quarantine that evil. And, and your means for doing that, hiding it, are not God's means of doing it, which is discipline. And so the ironic cause of excommunication here is the whole church that wouldn't nip this in the bud when it was much, much easier and manageable to do if you did it God's way. The church that opts out of discipline causes excommunication. Ooh, I don't like excommunication. I, I see a room and I see s smoke and I see awkwardness and I've got all these awkward explanations to give my kids and my kids will lose friends. I don't want that to happen. Then discipline before that happens. That's what Paul's saying. Oh no, I could put a lid on it. I could. So you who claim that you don't want that room to happen, it's gonna happen one way or the other if you don't discipline. God's lid, God's cover. And we could talk all different ways in application. Maybe we will next week about how you do that appropriately if it's just one-on-one -on -one and mentoring and so forth. That's, those are legitimate questions. You don't do it the, the way you think of it as the Puritan way, but it's the American small group way. Let's all get together, boys and girls, and all confess our deepest, darkest sins. No, that's inappropriate. And <laughs> that should be obvious why. And, but I've been in churches, um, including some that I've started, um, that, 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 that is forced on you. And it's obviously inappropriate for obvious reasons. Um, but there is a real thing. 
confessing one to another, James 5.16 says. That's, um, that's an imperative for the church. That's how you put a lid on it. Not by hiding it, by bringing it out in an appropriate context. Okay, finally, thirdly, the man's sin discredits and contaminates. Again, this is not an exhaustive list here in 1 Corinthians 5 that we see for sins because it's not an exhaustive chapter. I always say 1 Corinthians 5 and Matthew 18 are not a panacea for church discipline. In other words, it's not as simple as I followed the three steps, I counted to three, and oh my goodness, don't be an elder. Um, Because there's a lot of things in that passage that he doesn't tell you. It's not meant to tell you everything about church discipline, but it is normative. You do do at least this much. This guides us. This is the the backbone, um, the spine, the the basics, the foundations of church discipline. But Paul's addressing a real-life situation. And so we can use it as a spirit-inspired test case. So two ways to look at an extreme example. Typical way we do it, oh, that's so extreme. Somebody says, Hitler, Nazis, Holocaust, and all of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, well, that's not me. He's talking about somebody else because I'm you know, clean and pure as the wind-driven snow, a lot like those people. But um, sometimes an extreme case is actually meant to make us think, well, I wonder if I have that sin in me, and the reason it hasn't gone out this way is because of some good stuff uh, that God has put in my life or in the world. And, and that's the right answer. That's how we're supposed to react. So, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Note the phrase, sexual immorality among you. Not Aiken, that pervert. See, what happened was in the 1990s, Bill Clinton convinced us all that what a man does in private does not affect what he does in public. And we all bought it. Because what's the alternative? Well, I don't, want the, 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 I don't want so-and-so policing me, whether it's the state or the church or some creepy guy or whatever else. I, I don't want Big Brother. Hold on now. So those are your two alternatives? Big Brother or Bill Clinton? I think we can do better. Um, maybe, let's just take one principle at a time, and that sin, like the proverb says, is like fire. It spreads needs to be contained. There is sexual immorality among you, meaning the church. There is sexual immorality among your people. No, there's not. It's that guy. I'm not doing that. True, don't fly to the other extreme. So don't correct the collectivist mistake of confusing the individual with the corporate guilt and that garbage that's going on in the social gospel right now. Don't fly to the other extreme and say there's no such thing as communities with responsibility to protect the fires on the ship. Um, There's sexual immorality among your community. Sexual immorality is not private immorality only. It always affects everyone else around you. The word itself used here, pornea, is very particular. We're going to explain it a bit more next week. We'll get more into the nature of this sin versus other sins and what's going on in that list. But just catch for the moment the first reason why this sexual immorality cannot be tolerated in the body. And now Paul is going to mix metaphors. Body like you're thinking, body of Christ, and he's going to, he's going to mix those together in these chapters. Um, but what's the first reason why this can't be tolerated? Verse 1, he continues, it's of a kind that's not even tolerated among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. So do you see his first piece of rationale? Even the pagans know this is Jerry Springer material. It's why they're watching Jerry Springer. You just won a ticket to the show. Good job. But don't interpret that the wrong way. The pagans are laughing at us right now. They see our inconsistency. They see our hypocrisy. They see we say we believe this, but we we, we do this. That's the point, but don't draw the wrong conclusion. The point is not that sexual immorality is just fine until it reaches that point. The whole point is to say this thing has to be quarantined, cut out, so that it doesn't get to that point. We read it totally backwards. Well, if if I just put a lid, I'll just put a lid, meaning I'll pretend. That that's not God's lid. Just the opposite's going on here. It got to this point because you bought into the lie that what a man does in private has no bearing 
on his public character and on the people around him. Now, naturally, this raises the question, which sins get you excommunicated? At least that's what a lot of people would ask at this point. What sins exactly discredit the name of Christ or contaminate the whole body. Now, a fuller answer is going to come in verse 11, and one of the things we'll do next week is talk about kinds of sins, um, rationale for that, um, and all sorts of things like that. So we'll get to that next week. But one last thing about this man's sin um, discrediting and contaminating. Presbyterians have a couple words for this, and they're funny words, and you look at them, and you're like, okay, it looks like a bunch of Presbyterians had too much time on their hands. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's in the dictionary, but come on, seriously. Um, but but they're good words, and uh, let, let's see what they mean, because I think it's what Paul's getting at here. Um, two words for where to draw the line. When is discipline that should always be going on? We should always be under discipline. I should be under discipline right now. Formative discipline. Discipling. Challenging me. Praying with me. Discipline. Shaping each other. Counseling each other. As Romans 15 says, where Paul says, you are, you are all able to counsel each other in these matters. Um, but but what, gets, what gets you to excommunication level? What gets you to red alert, red zone, that kind of thing? Well, Presbyterians have two words for it. The sin has to be notorious, and the other is a little stranger to our ears. The sinner has to be contumacious. Um, I, remember when, I remember when Jonathan Van Hoogen first said that word to me, contumacious, and that was my reaction. I was like, yep, Presbyterians have had too much time on their hands. <laughs> but no, it's, it's a word. Um, and it means something. And one of these refers to the sin. It's a notorious sin. And one of these refers to the sinner. A sin is notorious or infamous if it's a public disgrace. You see that? Even the pagans, you see Paul's rationale, they're looking. You made them look, but it wasn't for a good reason. That's notorious. Loud about something that's totally not like Christ. It drags the name of Christ into the mud, so to speak. It makes our gospel look bad. It makes our witness look not credible. Now, the sinner is contumacious or in a state of contumacy when he's wholly unrepentant. If the word's weird for you, just think of the flagrant foul in basketball. Flagrant. Um, in other words, totally unrepentant. Um, not just not getting it, purposefully not getting it, um, wandering off the reservation, palm in the face, no signs of caring, pretty much saying, I intend to do more of it, um, don't want to hear it, not heeding the counsel of brothers and sisters. This passage in 1 Corinthians perfectly displays the senses of these two words, notorious sin, contumacious sinner. That's where you draw the line. Here we have a man who has committed a notorious sin and is flagrant about it. And I draw that out because Paul is really saying, like undisciplined church member, like church. You think he's arrogant? Then why didn't you do anything about it? You're his arrogance writ large. You are his arrogance on steroids. You're the courtroom saying, that's cool. Sin that rages out of control and doesn't care who knows it, that sin will be a contagion. And the whole church that tolerates it will become it. One caveat, though, before we close on this man's sin. The title of the sermon, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Excommunication, when we've been too arrogant for normal discipline, the assumption there, or at least the conclusion you could draw. Okay, so Matt's saying that if anyone needs to be excommunicated, the church has been in sin in this way. There's exceptions. Um, a, a false teaching um, or rank immorality or a firebombing of gossip and slander can come out of nowhere, seemingly. That doesn't mean the people have been arrogant as a rule. It might mean that the leadership has been arrogant and ignoring a breach in the city walls because the leaders should certainly know about it. But just be aware of that important footnote. There's exceptions, and I'm saying that. There's exceptions, okay? Um, now, I said at the beginning, and I'll say it again, discipline is a cover to sin, but not the bad kind you're thinking. It's a good cover. Two coverings in the Garden of Eden after sin. 
The first was the man's devices, his efforts, his hiding a fig leaf. The second was God's gracious provision, representing a sacrifice. And we don't receive that latter one, the covering, because of how wonderful we've performed a church discipline. We need church discipline because of sin. But all the church discipline in the world, all the talking to in the world, all the behavioral modifications in the world won't deal with sin. When Christ covered our sin, that does not mean that he simply covered it, but that one day there's this fear that he'll uncover it, maybe on judgment day. But when it says that he covers our sins, that means that he washes our sins away with his blood. That our sins are actually punished in him. In that courtroom, all of our sins are nailed to the cross, Colossians 2 says. They're dealt with in Christ. God remembers them no more. That doesn't mean he forgot or he had a knowledge problem. That means he does not know them in that relational sense. He is no longer a judge over us, but a father to us. Christ covers our sins in the ultimate way that we need, and therefore we can do church discipline, though we'll stumble at it, though we won't understand it at many times, but we can respond to the gospel because of how Christ actually covered us forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news of your son's covering. We thank you that it is not simply a hiding of something that you are still angry at us for, but it is a washing away, dealing with the guilt because you punished your son instead of us. We thank you, Lord, for your gracious gift. We do pray that you would challenge us to exalt Christ as the rightful king of the church, that we would participate in the court of the church and stop being arrogant or fearful, perhaps, of things that have happened in our past, but that we would see Christ as exalted, that we would glorify him as judge and king over the church to bring down his sword and to make the divisions that purify your body over time. Make us humble in accepting that and by your grace and with your help participating in it. Let us worship you now as king. In Christ's name, amen.